why are there four imams? Why them? Why not others? Those four imams came in an era after the first three generations, and some of them were of the end of the third generation, and some of them came after, where knowledge began to get written down and systematized. Okay? They began to systematize their knowledge, and they began to write it down, and these were the leaders in that field. In the realm of, let's say, uh, technology. Technology generally came about, computers and that, level, that uh, type of tech came out a certain time. You ended up with certain leaders. And today you can count the people who make computers on your hands. You're either going to get an HP, you're going to get a Sony, you're going to get a Mac, you're going to get whatever else, Samsung. It's not a hundred people who make computers. At a certain point, Okay, they take up the whole market and no, there's very hard for anyone to enter the market. So what at the beginning of a certain era, there come a lot of people who do it, but eventually some dominate over others. And at that time, you could say there were 11. That span of 100, 200 years, there were 11 methods. 11. Four of them survived. Seven of them just died out. They didn't have enough followers and their books are there, but we don't revive them because we need certainty. We don't know who transcribed those books. We don't know if there are mistakes in the books. The men have must be living. So the question of why are there four, simply put it, uh, these were the first to document and codify knowledge and put it all in one methodology. And there were many, but not all of them survived. Just like many people come into any industry and make cars, you know how many car companies there were in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s? But not all of them survived. And you end up with a handful of car companies. It's very hard to, to get into that market. So now you end up, that's how we end up with the four schools and the four methods. As we said earlier, we talked about why methods exist. It's because of how they interpret the unique uh, texts, the equivocal or speculative texts. And we talked about how the new matters come about. And we talked about how they manage hadith. These are the reasons why madhab exists. Now let me give you a simple example of how the four madhabs differ with one another. And this isn't exhaustive by any means, but it'll give you a good idea. First of all, the difference, the, the, the opinion of Abu Hanifa regarding the Qur'an and the Sunnah is that the Qur'an is always is a su superior source to the Sunnah. It's a superior source to the Sunnah. The and in Hadith, which ends up being the Madagi school, the Tafri school, and the Hanbali school, yeah, even though um, Ahmad was from Iraq, they say, no, no, no. The Quran and Sunnah are absolutely equal sources. Now, between Madik and Ash Shafi'i, they differed on within the Sunnah. Within the Sunnah, what is the strongest type of Sunnah? They both agree that the sound hadith that has many, many chains is the number one uh, source. They differed now on number two. Madik said that the actions of the scholars of Medina and their rulings okay, cannot possibly be wrong. It is equivalent with the first layer, what's called the a wide spread. Shafri said no. So you can't say that. And he prefers the solitary, had eight solitary meats, came down at one chain. He prefers that over Maddox's opinion about the scholars of Medina. Maddox's logic was that A, this is what our, his, his teachers were doing. And B, that it's impossible for a whole generation of scholars that close to the prophet and the companions to have made a mistake. It's impossible. The, they a thousand from a thousand, as Rabbi Yatsubrahi said. So that's a difference between one of the major differences between Madik and Ashaf. What about Imam Ahmed? Imam Ahmed has a very unique take on this, and he holds all of it to be Sunnah. And every statement of a companion, Ahmed, out of piety and honoring the companions, did not want to judge between them. 
all of that would be sunnah. That's why whenever you hear someone talk about Hanbali school, they will say in one of the opinions of the Hanbali school, because Imam Ahmad honored and respected every opinion of a companion. And he holds all of that to be sunnah. And Imam Ahmad honored hadith so much, he preferred a solitary hadith, even a, a not so strong hadith over analogy. Whereas none of the other three before him would do that. If the report was not solid enough to make law upon, they prefer analogy over the weak hadith. That's a basic summary on why we ended up with four methods and how these four differ with one another.